London newsagents. And the rod of equity and mercy, a symbol of covenant and peace. May the Spirit of the Lord who anointed Jesus at his baptism so anoint you this day that you might exercise... That was the King's coronation less than a year ago. Remember that sound of normality, of continuity, of a sense of authority, of, of the wheels staying on even after the Queen's death. Yet suddenly... We're feeling in a much more vulnerable place with regard to the royal family and just who's leading it. And social media is driving so much of this in a way that it feels that the palaces have a communications playbook that was written in a pre-Twitter, pre-TikTok age. And they haven't caught up with what is happening out there. And that is driving the narrative and driving what a lot of the newspapers are reporting. So the question is, how do they catch up? How do they respond? Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And later in the show, we're going to be talking about a story which has come out of Brussels in the last 24 hours. And the EU Council, don't go to sleep, it's really, really important because there is a story about the EU's commitment to Ukraine, which on the surface is rhetorically very strong. They're still talking the good talk. But in the last 24 hours, they've basically cut off a key source of income and in effect economic aid, all in the name, basically, of French farmers. But we're going to start with the royal family. And today I've been speaking to someone who is uh, close to the palaces he has worked there he is very regular he's still regularly in touch with prince william i've got nothing new to say in terms of medical bulletin reports but it's given me a clearer understanding of the state of play within those palaces and the word that was used to describe it to me was fractious there is a fractiousness because you've got the king sick with cancer you've got the princess of wales having got, undergone major surgery Prince Andrew, as we know, who has taken a step back from public life following your interview, Emily, uh, with him for Newsnight in 2019. We've got the Sussexes in Montecito doing their own thing. And what was described to me as a lingering sourness in the relationships. And you have got Prince William, who is desperate, stubbornly insisting to protect the privacy of his family and saying, look, we said it would be Easter before we do anything in public. We're sticking to that and we're not going to bow to the demands of social media or mainstream media in the process. And you just got a sense of they don't quite know what to do because the communications advice is absolutely clear. Get out there, have a lovely photo of you looking at get well cards and people wishing you better and you thanking them for it. But they don't want to do it. They've said it would be Easter and that's what they're sticking to. I guess the question is whether they are feeling pressure to respond to a new digital age. And for anyone not on TikTok, which is maybe half of the country, then they don't understand what the problem is. Kate asked for three months. She's recovering. She's recuperating. Anyone in her position, you imagine, would want the same, would do the same. If you were working, you know, in a job and you'd had major surgery, you would ask for three months off sick leave. That's basically what she's doing. For anyone who is on TikTok, and we think that's about 25 million people in this country, the craziness of the memes and the discussion and the conspiracy and the hyperbole is sort of driving this whole narrative to really dark and frightening places. And I guess the question is whether the palace should be responding mm. to that stuff, which is basically conspiracy, or should be nothing to see here, 1950s, please go away, we'll tell you when we're ready. And I think that's where we're slightly divided, right? I think that is a really interesting question. And I think in a way, this is why this story in some sense is even is bigger than the royal family, because it is a question basically now, this story of media ecosystems mm. and the fact that different institutions are basically wrestling with exactly this question, because you see it manifest in different stories in different places. Do you, as an institution, in this case, the royal family, do you respond to, are you actually even aware of the extent of 
online conspiracy and in many cases misinformation, the sheer kind of how frenetic the conversation is? Or do you basically say, decide to sort of distance yourself from it and not respond to it at all? I think the royal family, funnily enough, is kind of uniquely exposed to this by comparison to some other institutions, mainly because some of the factors are in their control, some of them aren't. So, John, you've already alluded to it. There is just a moment which is just pure contingency where a lot of them are absent. Some of that is to do with illness. Some of that is to do with the fact that parts of the family are basically exiled. And that means there's a vacuum. The royal family in particular is uniquely exposed to vacuum because it is basically a kind of honorific part of the constitution because it doesn't do anything other than is basically seen. If you're not seen, then what is there? What there is is a vacuum and into it fills in the modern age at least, and perhaps it always did, but in the modern age there is a particular place for it to manifest itself, conspiracy, largely through TikTok, and, is it really, and Twitter. And it is a really interesting question as to whether you respond to that or not. Look, the key performance indicators of the royal family are not the number of widgets that are coming off a factory production line. The yeah. key performance indicators are how many front pages you've got, how many seconds you've got on the 6 and the 10 o'clock news, or whatever it happens to be, how many photos are going out to photo agencies around the world. Being seen is what your productivity is. It's your currency. Is. It's your currency, mm. exactly. The other thing that was said to me by this person who kind of has worked at the palace and is still in touch with uh, Prince William is that this symbiotic relationship that has developed between social media and mainstream media, exactly as you say, that mainstream media will write stories on the basis of look at the pressure there is on social media. Say X thousand people have liked a tweet that said X or X million people have seen a TikTok that says Y. And that they write that as a story, as if it is the justification for the story. It's not a press release from Kensington Palace that has led to the story. It's what's been on social media that may be totally without foundation, may be from Russian bots. We have no idea. But that generates the news content that then generates more social media content. <laughs> and you are in a, a doom loop. And that is what the palace is unable to control right now. So the question is, if Prince William wants privacy for his family and we know if there's one thing we understand about Prince William he does he wants privacy for those closest to him for uh, all the a whole host of the most understandable reasons in the world does he get that privacy from shutting everything down completely or does he get that privacy from saying here's a photo now go away and the deal with the devil and I think where the brothers have disagreed is that William has been the one to compromise to say here's a photo now leave us alone we know from inside the media, the media doesn't leave you alone, actually. If there is one photo, you probably want more. I'm if not there sure is I one. Agree. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's exactly where the Harry and William debate is. That Harry thinks if you sh show an ankle, they want your knee, right? William thinks if you do one bit before you go onto the skiing slopes, then they leave you away no, on I your skiing. No, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with you about the idea that if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. I think that's absolutely true. And I think you, you put it very eloquently. I think the thing that is not quite right is that I think actually the media has left them alone. Look, that paparazzi picture. TMZ stuff. The TMZ picture of uh, Kate in the car with her mother was not put on any... UK outlets There's a difference between not publishing the photo because Kensington Palace has asked you to and leaving them alone. I mean, you know, us included, we haven't really left them alone. But we can't we leave are... them alone, can we? Because uh, of who, we, who they are. I mean, we can leave them alone on a sort of pap level, and obviously, you know, which they'll You're never do. You're not there with your little not, iPhone. No, no, is that not, not, no, not yet. No, well, <laughs> leave it till this afternoon. Let's do it for an evening. But we're not there papping them or anything like that. But on one level, I mean, and I think this is where the William expectation which I can of course understand for historic reasons and, and, and his desire but of course it is unrealistic in one sense for him in particular which is the future king and his wife is the future queen and particularly with his father's illness let's just you know be totally blunt that could come sooner than perhaps we imagined it might so and, in a way and, it and is the, unrealistic yeah and the other thing I've been told sooner than he would ever want I mean Prince William is guarding the privacy. He wants to protect Kate. He doesn't want history to repeat itself with what happened to his mother. He wants to protect the children as far as it is possible to do, given the demands and understandable need 
to show yourself in public. Yeah, I mean, I think there was just... It, this is the clash of two PR strategies. And I think mm. their biggest mistake was to put out the Mother's Day photo. Because as soon as they did that... It was a kind of begrudging, well, all right, here you go. We'll we'll call this Mother's Day. And that was when obviously everything kicked off and the Photoshop and the kill notice. And he, I think, untold damage actually to, to, to whatever they put out next. If he'd actually just walked away and said, sorry, anyone who said they'll be off duty for three months because of an illness should be respected. We're not doing that with King Charles. Yeah, in a way, they've they've had a sort of worst of both worlds, right? Right. They've sort of been half in or they've dipped their toe into being seen as if they're going to respond to this online stuff whilst not fully responding to it, i.e. not being fully transparent. And it sort of feels, yeah, maybe I'm mean, right. Maybe they should will. have chosen one or other and stuck with it yeah, as opposed and I, to the current one. I bet one. you we do hear about her illness and I bet you there's a lot of people who then kind of go, oh, God, right. I get it. Awful. We'll leave you alone. Well, let us speak now to Peter Hunt. He is LBC's royal correspondent. Before that, he worked with all of us at the BBC as a royal correspondent. And let's get his take on what is happening right now. Peter, the pieces fall where they fall. Is there anything that the royal family and the palaces could have done differently from what they've done? Where do I begin? Um, I think I think if you take the William and Kate bit of it, clearly here we have a woman who's seriously ill, a woman who's entitled to her privacy, a woman who is entitled to be left alone. So at the get-go, they had a media strategy that is now in complete tatters. And that media strategy was to say very little, to say she had abdominal surgery, it wasn't cancer-related, and that she would keep her personal medical information and that would remain private. Now, we can argue till the dogs come home as to whether or not they should have put more into the public domain. My gut tells me that if they had been slightly more upfront at that juncture, they may have got greater public understanding and a greater ability for people to say, look, this is a woman who's been ill, back off, and this is the reason she is not in the public domain at the moment until sometime after Easter. But they chose not to. They went for that minimalist approach, but they've failed to sustain it because I think they have been then spooked by the, frankly, nonsense that has swirled around uh, everywhere for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I think we all should be mindful of the fact it's, it's very easy for everyone to blame social media, but it becomes a bit of a feeding frenzy, doesn't it? Because what has occupied the column inches of the papers is their coverage of the social media. So each feeds off the other. And I mean, we've all got anecdotes of it, haven't we? I mean, I travelled on a train yesterday where for 20 minutes of the journey, there were four young people and their conversation started with someone saying, oh yeah, Kate's missing. So that that gives you a flavour of what is out there. And I think it is that flavour that has spooked William and Kate. Peter, you, you said she was seriously ill. I mean, are you just going by what what the knowledge we have allows for, which is that you know, she's off work, she's off royal duties for at least three months? Or do you think that we have slightly underestimated what the surgery meant? No, I mean, I, I have absolutely no knowledge uh, beyond that which you, you have and your listeners and viewers have, which was in that statement. But clearly, you know, it's not a stub toe. and It is something involving abdominal surgery and it's something that has necessitated her disappearing from public view. I mean, it's so interesting what you're saying, because it feels like that this is different from Diana, but the same. With Diana, you'd wait and see what was in the newspapers. You'd wait and see what the paps had got in the the sun or the mail or the mirror or wherever it happened to be. But now it's happening in social media. And yet it doesn't feel as though royal communications have kept pace with where we are. Well, I think they might struggle to keep pace with where they are, but they could have chosen a path whereby they chose to ignore it. And that may have worked, but they chose not to. I used the word spooked earlier. I mean, I think the first example of them being spooked was that picture released for um, Mother's Day. They did not need to release a photo. They'd said she wouldn't be around, but they chose to. And one has to assume they did because of their concern over what was out there with all this nonsense about whether she was missing. Do you see this as a battle of wills between what the Prince and Princess of Wales want to do and what possibly their PR advisors or their palace officials are saying they should do? 
I think in any battle, William wins. And, and William is, is, a, is a Mr. Private. Well, I think what the, what's really fascinating is I think actually the battle that is going on is within William. There are two completely understandable characteristics of his that are, are at play at the moment and, are, and they are battling with each other. So there's the William who is understandably obsessed with privacy. He's obsessed with the privacy of his family. He's obsessed with the privacy of his wife. And he's obsessed with history not repeating itself with, with his mother, uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. But that is in conflict in the last few weeks with the other aspect of William. And when I did his first broadcast interview, he was a student 20 years ago. And in that interview, the bit that's always stuck in my mind is he said, I hate losing control. And that aspect of control has driven his life as a senior royal as he heads towards his destiny of being king. And in the last few weeks, he has lost control. I think it's that bit of it has then led us to the Mother's Day picture and the consequences of that. Having the British monarchy referenced in the same breath as North Korea and Iran is, is not a good step, is it, when the picture agencies talked about killing it. But we, we've also come on to discuss what we've seen overnight into today, whereby we have the pictures of them on the front page of The Sun, on the front page of the Daily Mail, of them shopping. I mean, they had an absolute expectation of privacy when they went shopping. That cannot be debated or argued. And those pictures would not have appeared on those papers if the editors of those papers weren't reasonably confident William and Kate wouldn't kick up if they were published. And has Kensington Palace said anything since? Not a word. That's so interesting because there is kind of a variety of different theories about that is that one, that maybe a photographer had been tipped off it might be a good idea to have someone with a camera outside this farm shop in Windsor you're not saying that you're saying look it may have well have been a random photo that someone just picked up but that the papers would not have run it if there was serious pushback uh, from the palace well I think we can contrast it can't we with and never have we spoken so much about photographs of one woman we contrast it with the pap picture of the Princess of Wales Kate with her mother that was shown internationally but didn't appear in any UK publication. And it's pretty clear that Kensington Palace made it pretty clear to the editors involved that they would very much rather it wasn't used. And, and I suppose in terms of when we talk about William's battles, the one he really has won is it's vanishingly rare now to see paparazzi pictures of the royals, particularly of William and Kate and their children, in publications here. So that was made pretty clear to them not to use that picture. And then we come to this one now. And if you, on the version of events that's out there in the public domain, courtesy of TMZ and The Sun, it was, as you say, taken by a member of the public. You also, you have to see the context. You know, The Sun is the paper that has run a front page saying, lay off Kate. I mean, their whole drive is we need to give this woman space and the stuff on social media is terrible. So in that context, it's just not credible that they would have then chosen to put those pictures where they had put them if they hadn't checked what the reaction would have been of the couple. I suppose one other question I've got for you, Peter, wider question is, when you were and I were at the BBC, when we were all at the BBC and you were doing the Royal Correspondent Beat, um, there was always the Queen on the throne. So whatever dramas there were, involving, dare I say, minor royals or not as senior as the Queen. There was that sense that there was the glue of Her Majesty on the throne and that just felt an absolute constant in our lives. Whereas now, everything seems in flux. She's been called many things and she probably wouldn't have liked to be called this, but she was a massive security blanket. During those dreadful years for them of the 90s, she managed to emerge from them unscathed. I mean, her greatest threat to her reign really was the sort of week or so after the death of Diana, Princess of Wales in 1997, with the headlines of show us you care. So there were a few days where there were questions about her, but she managed to turn that corner by traveling down from Scotland, she having argued that her priority was to look after her grandchildren, and appearing in London, and so dissipated very quickly that, that sense of she was out of touch. But you, you rightly say that she managed to be above all that. And I think her absence has exposed the institution to the problems, the risks that they are now facing. And if you take the position of the king, his key moment really was that first moment when he delivered that speech to the nation on accession. And that was pitch perfect in that he made it very clear that he would follow her example and he wouldn't continue being what his critics said was a meddlesome prince. Then he had the coronation. So he had started well, but of course it's now being challenged by the fact of his illness. Yeah, so interesting to hear from you. Peter, thank you. Peter, thanks so much. My pleasure. Nous abordons 
à coup sûr un moment de notre Europe où il conviendra de ne pas être lâche. On ne veut jamais voir les drames qui viennent. On ne veut jamais voir ce qui se joue. That was President Macron speaking a little earlier this month, urging his compatriots not to be cowards. Well, you heard that, you know all that, obviously. We've gone quite highbrow for this half, but bear with us because we think it's a really important story. You say it apologetically like we shouldn't be highbrow. We're always highbrow. <laughs> We're even more highbrow this half hour. as highbrow as it gets. Yes. Their brows are at the ceiling. They, they are literally off the charts yeah. brows. But we're talking about this because we think it plays into two really important themes. One is how far we're prepared to support Ukraine. By we, we mean European countries. And the other is how worried we should be about the rise of populism coming from farming groups across Europe who feel that if they're not being listened to, there's only one way to go, and that is against the mainstream. So the background to this is that uh, there have been lots of farming groups across Europe, particularly in France, where, of course, the agricultural sector is, is large, complaining to national leaders not only about EU legislation on green matters, which they say is affecting their, their business and how they could, on how they farm, but also specifically about Ukraine and about the fact that because of preferential deals that since the war the EU has granted to Ukraine to make it easier to access EU markets because of course the Ukrainian economy has halved since the start of the war and although we talk about munitions and arms all the time it is really really important that Ukraine's economy is kept afloat insofar as it is possible they have been complaining about these preferential deals which they say on things like wheat and eggs and poultry are costing them business because Ukrainian farms can outcompete on cost and labour in all sorts of ways and are undercutting domestic European farming. And at the EU Council meeting, which has been going on over the past few days, over the last week, Playbook in the EU are reporting that President Macron, among others, has led a charge to agree to impose tariffs on those agricultural commodities, on those markets, that will basically cost... Ukraine a couple of billion euros in terms of business. And of course, this is just putting into sharp focus this idea of our commitment to Ukraine. Well, it, up to a point. Yeah. So I, I kind of think you could kind of crystallize it like this, that Macron has made this very high and mighty speech. But what is he more frightened of? Is it Russian tanks rolling across Ukraine and onto the rest of Europe or French tractors descending on Paris. And you'd have to say that from what you've seen, French tractors are more scary to him and the Elysee Palace than the Russian tanks. Yeah, and Because it's... it's a deal that Vladimir Putin must be laughing. He's secured this wonderful victory in that free and fair election. And now he's seeing the French are saying, oh, my God, our farmers are upset. Mon Dieu, qu'est-ce que je vais faire? And I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to surrender. Yeah, but it's not just the French farmers. As Lewis says, it's been going on across various European countries. In Poland, for the last, what, two or three weeks, they've had smoke bombs, fires, thousands of angry farmers demonstrating in Warsaw across this you know, this, what seems to be an unfair set of rules. They're giving cheap Ukraine imports the right to undercut what they're doing. Everything we've learned about, you know, Brexit votes, about Trump votes, about, about the rise of Gert Wilders, your little mate in the Netherlands. We're very close. <laughs> very close. OK, so yeah. he didn't actually get into power in the end. But Not everything yet. that has shown you that if the farming community thinks that they are not being listened to, they're not suddenly going to put down their pitchforks and go, oh, you're right, let's stop Putin in his tracks. They're going to say, where's Marine Le Pen? Now, is that the better outcome of this? I don't know. And of course, the context of this is that we are two months away, less than two months away, from EU elections, parliamentary elections, which, of course, we're no longer part of, but which are a massive part of the European political calendar and where it is widely expected that parties like the PVV, Head Builders, Marine Le Pen, National Rally and so on, are going to do really well. And that is partly off the back of the agricultural discontent that there is in these countries. But it obviously throws up a wider issue as well, which is like, you know, the EU on paper is supposed to be working towards Ukrainian accession at some yeah. point, either yeah. when the war is over or not. And indeed, if there is a peace deal eventually, part of that deal will probably rest on the idea of 
let's imagine, I mean, the Ukrainians still don't want to countenance this, but if there are some territorial concessions, let's say, that the price of that or that the benefit of Ukraine, the gain they would have is EU accession and NATO accession of whatever the new state of Ukraine looks like. And it's like, will Ukraine really find that idea very credible? If, consider, if Ukraine were a candidate country or were to accede to the EU, it would be by far and away the poorest member state. It would basically absorb huge subsidies in terms of regional development funding. Countries which are currently, like in Eastern Europe, which are currently net beneficiaries of development funding would become net contributors because all the money will go to Ukraine because, like I say, the Ukrainian economy has collapsed. And I don't you, think they'd do it like that. Well, they couldn't. They couldn't. They'd have to fence off the money that would go towards the reconstruction of Ukraine. I'm sure there are you know, bigger brains than mine on that right now. And that would be to use, presumably, the but, money taken from Russia, locked down the frozen assets that would then go to building Ukraine. Ukraine has kept up, I mean, extraordinarily yeah. parts of its economy and parts parts of its agricultural turnover throughout a war. I, suppose, I think that's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. What I'm saying, I suppose, is that if you're Zelensky or you're a Ukrainian politician and you're looking at potential promises in terms of accession to the EU, you might think, well, this is actually quite a minor thing. And at the very first hurdle, the solidarity, which yeah. is supposed to be there, yeah. just on agricultural subsidies, has disappeared. Never but, mind the much bigger <coughs> talks around wider accession. But the message seems to be Slava Ukraini up to a point. Yeah, up you to know, my eggs. Yeah, up to my eggs and up to my wheat. Beyond that, I'm not going to go. I just think, I can't imagine what it must feel like to be a Ukrainian at the moment, where you look east and you see yeah. that Vladimir Putin is there for another six years. And this is the thing that is going to define his leadership of Russia and whether he can rebuild the Russian empire about what happens in Ukraine. And you look west and you see the European Union saying, yeah, we'd like your eggs. We want to help. We care about what happens to you, but we're going to impose tariffs. And you look to America and you see Donald Trump potentially as the next president who's saying not a penny more for Ukraine. Also, it must be terrifying. Well, also, particularly when you consider the fact that despite all of the talk of you know massive sanctions being imposed in the wake of the um, invasion talk of more sanctions now in the wake of the death of Navalny and so on. The idea that the Russian economy was going to be cut off from European and Western From money. the SWIFT bank payment system and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, well, actually, you know, by all accounts, Moscow supermarket shelves are still full of EU products. Businesses are getting around the sanctions by basically exporting to neighbouring countries. There was a story out today from, that saying that UK car exports have gone up 2,000% to uh, Azerbaijan in the last year or so. Like, I don't think it's because suddenly the Azerbaijanis have developed a particular liking or a particular taste for Jaguar Land Rover. Yeah, whatever. to take in that many more British cars. The argument is, and different industry groups dispute this, but the argument is, like lots of industries, that Britain and other Western countries, companies, are getting around the sanctions by exporting their goods to Russia via another neighbouring country. I think that's fascinating, Lewis. Is that the companies getting around sanctions or is that companies saying look Azerbaijan want to buy our cars we can't have we can't control what happens to them next and it's the Azerbaijanis that are trying to get around the sanctions I think it's look I think it's a combination of things and there's lots of uh, data there's lots of data which shows that a lot of different goods from Western countries that were previously going to Russia are now going to a third neighboring party. state yeah, yeah going to former Soviet states like Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or whatever and you can see it in industry after industry. It's not just cars or, or whatever. You can see it in, in different industries that suddenly there's been, been this explosion in the last few years. And as I say, it's not because these countries have suddenly got a new appetite for all of these goods or have the capacity to absorb all of these goods. It stands to reason that someone somewhere is getting around the sanctions. I can feel a news agent's Twitter poll coming on. Can't oh? you? Yeah. Do you oh. want to see Ukraine helped or EU farmers subsidised? Vote here. Not that we're leading the question, of course, in that in, in, in that regard. Are you a bad <laughs> or you are a? Are you, okay. Or do you have you solidarity are you a, with the dear people like, of Ukraine? Yeah, no. What would you What would you call it then? No, I want it to be fair. Um, should Should, it, should we, EU is, farmers is, come first? Are we yeah. doing polling now? Yes. Yeah, I think we should okay. become a polling organisation. Yeah. Okay. I think newsagents polling. Dot Inc is the way to go. Okay. We'll be back in just a moment. You have an exhibition at no less an institution than the Victoria and Albert Museum in Kensington. And the exhibition is of villains. 
there is Osama bin Laden, there is Adolf Hitler, and there's a British politician who has been put alongside them, which might just cause a teeny wincy bit of controversy. Who is it? We're going to help you out here. <laughs> <laughs> the label next to this exhibition says, over the years, the evil character in the seaside puppet show has shifted from the devil to unpopular public figures, including Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden and Margaret Thatcher. Well, who would have thunk it that Margaret Thatcher would be put alongside those two? Uh, cue outrage, fury, I'm disgusted from various sections of the Conservative Party. I bet they're not really that disgusted. I bet they're not that outraged. I bet they are, actually, Lewis. I well, think they probably are. If It's just a punch and Judy, isn't it? Who cares? People just get constantly worked up about these things. I mean, honestly, it's well, just constantly worked up about being put on a ledge with Adolf Hitler. No, and but, Bin Laden. It's I about think I would but be. it's about Punch and Judy. I mean, actually, I think Thatcher would have been most thrilled about the fact that she was being satirised sort of constantly. I mean, she's big enough. She's big enough to have ended up manifested in all sorts of ways, including even the Punch and Judy. I think thing. the spitting image puppet that you know, if if for, for sort of our younger viewers, go back and look at the spitting image puppet of Margaret Thatcher during the nineteen eighties, because it was the pointiness of the nose and the sort of triangularness the of suits. the ears yeah. and the suits. It Tie. looked scary. Everything was meant <laughs> to look scary, wasn't it? You know my policy on stealing from one's friends? Cabinet. Mm. What do we call it when people go around stealing other people's property? Mm. You! Mm. A, a free market economy? <laughs> Rubbish! <coughs> what do we call it, David? Socialism. Well. Thatcher and Tebbit loved their portrayal because it made them look tough and mean and dangerous. And he was the employment secretary during the Thatcher era. He was known as the Chinkford skinhead because he represented that constituency uh, in sort of uh, North East London. And um, that's how he was referred to. And they loved it. Meanwhile, John Major was sat there as a grey man eating his peas. With his shirt with his tucked inside his underpants. Pants, pants mm, very very sad. sad. And exactly, there's no Punch and Judy of him. He'd love it. He's absolutely was, fine. That should have loved to have been known as a villain. Should have loved that. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 